listening to the voice 17104.com. Reverend Barb Ellerby is a disruptor. One of her assignments from God is to meet you where you are and then disrupt you by teaching you to replace who man says you are to who Abba Father sees you as and calls you to be. In these broadcasts, Reverend Barb will provide his word as a means of breaking old thought patterns and embracing his truth that you are fearfully and wonderfully made in his image. And that's not all he says about you. It's time for you to walk in your Ephesians 2.10 self as his unique masterpiece, recognizing he has called you and created you and I for such a time as this. Now sit back and enjoy tonight's broadcast. Good evening, family. Welcome to our Rohit's Child Ministry. I am Reverend Barbara Ellerby, and we're going to start with a short prayer. Father, we bless you and we praise you. We thank you and we love you. Father, we thank you, Lord, because you know us better than we know ourselves. Your word tells us you know our every thought before we think it and our every word before we speak it, yet you are still faithful and you still love us. You know the rebelliousness that's in us. You know the ugly that's in us, yet you still love us. We thank you, Lord, because you chose us in eternity past for such a time as this. You've called us, you've chosen us, you've adopted us, you've called us your own. Your faithfulness can be compared to nothing and no one. For there's no one that loves us as you love us. So the mere fact that you have not wiped us off of this earth, the mere fact that you still allow us to pray to you, the mere fact that you still love us as unlovable as we can be is humbling touch our heart mind and our spirit lord that we never take you for granted that we would begin to spend more time with you we ask lord that you give us wisdom knowledge understanding discernment as well as revelation change our hearts draw us closer to you Give us a fresh hunger and thirst for you and your word like never before. We say, speak, Lord, speak, come, Holy Spirit, come, touch and anoint each and all of us, Lord. Let us leave this broadcast differently than when we came in. For this word is always about you. We ask, Lord, these things in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, we say amen and amen. All right, family. So we finished up on Sunday on the title of praying for wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and discernment. And I thought I was done, but then I knew I wasn't. I knew there was more that needed to be covered. So I'm gonna share, excuse me, some scriptures with you, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about Paul before I even start. Paul writes this letter to the Colossians, And that's going to be the focus of our message. But before we even get there, I'm going to talk a little bit about him. You may know that Paul was a great persecutor of the Christians, that he found great pride in arresting, imprisoning, and in even some cases, killing Christians. He was raised as a, as a Jewish man, he knew all the Jewish laws and he followed them. And he didn't believe that this Jesus was this Messiah that people claimed he was. And he moved with a passion. He was very passionate about wiping these Christians off the face of the earth because what they were saying, what they were teaching, what they were doing was so to him different than what his Jewish culture had taught him. I love Paul because as passionate as he was about what he felt was doing the right thing, he has this Damascus Road experience with Jesus where he's going to get his next group of people that he's going to persecute. He has a letter giving him permission 
to persecute. And on the way to the city, he's on the Damascus road and has this encounter with Jesus where he's struck blind and he ends up being blind for three days. But in this blindness, Jesus is saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Paul is Saul, but he recognizes that it's not just Job standing next to him, saying this to him. He knows that it is somebody greater than him that's asking this question. And so he has this short conversation with Jesus and then they get him to the city and he's blind for three days. And on that third day, he regains his sight, but in regaining his physical sight, he received his spiritual insight. And the passion that he had for persecuting these Christians, he now has his own relationship with Jesus his own relationship with God, his own relationship with the Holy Spirit. And he knows that what he did in the past was wrong. And it becomes his new mission to move in obedience to Jesus. And he, he has the blessing because he moves in obedience. He has the blessing of being the one who writes the majority of the New Testament. He has the blessing of changing people's lives. And he has the blessing of dying for this belief that he has in Christ. The life that he lived was, again, as far as he knew, it was correct. It was passionate. And he was very strong because he was following the law. But when he began to follow the love, which was Jesus, it was even more passionate and he was able to do the greater things that Jesus prophesied that the disciples would do greater than he had done because again, he writes all of these books of the New Testament. And one of the things that had amazed me years ago was understanding that a large part of what he was writing, he was writing while he was in prison and he was so dangerous to the Roman Empire. They had him shackled to guards when he was in prison. And there was four sets of guards that would guard him. He had a captive audience. And it's one of those times for me that I have to laugh because it takes me to Genesis 50, 20. You meant me harm, but God used it for good. So while they plan to hold him hostage, to hold him in prison, he still got a chance to share the word of God. He ministered to each one of those guards that would have been with him as well as he did the writing that he needed to do. So he writes a letter to the Colossians. And the beginning of this letter is a prayer. And I wanna get to it, but before I get to it, I need to share two other scriptures with you. The first one is found in James, the first chapter. Starting the fifth and sixth verse, it says, if any of you lacks wisdom to guide him through a decision or circumstance, he is to ask of our benevolent God who gives to everyone generously and without rebuke or blame, and it will be given to him. But he must ask for wisdom in faith without doubting God's willingness to help for the ones who doubt is like a billowing surge of the sea that is blown about and tossed by the wind. And I'm, I'm doing, I'm giving you these two scriptures as almost like a comparative. This is to all of us. If you, especially young Christians, if you lack wisdom, if you don't understand, ask God. You hear me pray for wisdom, knowledge, understanding, discernment, and you hear me add recently revelation. 
And I ask these because not only do I need wisdom, we all need wisdom. And don't be ashamed to ask for wisdom. James is very clear. If any of you lacks wisdom, ask God for it, okay? And what I want you to think about, again, that's James, the first chapter, verses five and six. The next scripture I'm gonna share with you is Hebrews, the fifth chapter, the 12th through the 14th verse. It says, for, for though by this time you ought to be teachers because of the time you've had to learn these truths, meaning the word of God, you actually need someone to teach you again the elementary principles of God's words from the beginning. And you have come to be continually in need of milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is doctrinally inexperienced and unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a spiritual infant. But solid food is for the spiritually mature whose senses are trained to be, excuse me, are trained by practice to distinguish between what is morally good and what is evil. So when we look at this scripture, those young in Christ are getting the milk, are getting fed. We as Christians need to be maturing continuously. We should not still be at the same place we were when we got saved 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20, 30, 40 years ago. There should be growth in us. If there's not, then we're still on milk. And when you think about it in comparison to a child, when a child's born, they get, they start off with milk and hopefully they're not lactose intolerant and they can drink milk their whole life. But there comes a point when you begin to introduce food that goes from soft food to solid food. And that's what we need to be as Christians. We, we, we need to be spending this time with God, the developing of intimacy, the growing closer to him, the drawing closer to him, the leaning on him, the getting better understanding of him. Because that's where the maturing shows. We have to understand that this walk that we're on is not just about us individually. There's things that he's called each of us to do. There's a reason that each of us have been birthed into this world for such a time as this. As we look at this letter that he writes to the Colossians, I wanna say before I read it, it's interesting that he writes this letter of encouragement and information and he's praising a group of people that he's never met. He's not been there, but he knows that they began as a faithful people, but he also knows that the enemy is trying to plant people in there that will distract them. So he starts off this first chapter with a greeting and then he goes into a prayer. So it begins with the first verse, Paul, an apostle, special, excuse me, special messenger, personally chosen representative of Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed, by the will, in God, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful believers in Christ who are in Col Colossa, grace to you and peace inner calm, spiritual well-being from God our Father. I wanna stop there real quick because I, I wanted to share with you um, on the subject of grace and mercy. And this is just a side note. People think grace and mercy so many times are the same thing, but grace um, is when God gives us, wait, God in his grace gives me what I do not deserve. Yet God in his mercy does not give me what I do deserve. So I wanted you to understand that there is a difference 
between grace and mercy. Hopefully I did not disappear. I forgot to put on my phone the do not disturb and a call came in. So hopefully I didn't disappear. You could still hear me. But I want us to, to look at this first chapter of Galatians again, starting now at the third verse. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we pray always for you. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, how you lean on him with absolute confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness, and of the unselfish love which you have for all the saints, God's people, because of the confident hope of experiencing that which is reserved and waiting for you in heaven. You previously heard of this hope in the message of truth, the gospel regarding salvation, which has come to you. Indeed, just as in the whole world, the gospel is constantly bearing fruit and spreading by God's power, just as it has been doing among you ever since the day you first heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth, becoming thoroughly and deeply acquaint acquainted with it. You learn it from our representative Epithet, Epiphras, excuse me, our beloved fellow bond servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf. And he has also told us of your love, well grounded and nurtured in the Holy Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about it, we have not stopped praying for you, asking specifically that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom, with insight into his purposes and an understanding of spiritual things, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, displaying admirable character, moral courage, and personal integrity to fully please him in all things, bearing fruit in every good work and steadily growing in the knowledge of God with deeper faith clearer insight and fervent love for his precepts. We pray that you may be strengthened and invigorated with all power according to his glorious might to attain every kind of endurance and patience with love, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints, God's people in the light. For he has rescued us and drawn us to him from the dominion of darkness and has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption because of his sacrifice resulting in the forgiveness of our sins and the cancellation of sins penalty. Now, again, that is a prayer that Paul is praying regarding them and letting, letting the Colossians know that we pray for you constantly. And if you Notice in the beginning, it says we pray. It is different from we are praying because we are praying many times. People think, think that the praying is a were instead of an is. But he wanted it clear to them that we are praying for you. Even as I write this letter, we pray for you. You are on our prayer list because we want you to walk in the truth of who God is. We want you to walk with that wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and discernment. We don't want you to be confused by these people that are coming in that would knock you off point and, and make you believe that you don't need Jesus Christ, that there's other ways for salvation. And the irony of this letter is that right now, we too are going through a time where we have Many people, many preachers, many celebrities that will tell us that Jesus is not the only way, that there's other ways to get to heaven. If you have the spiritual wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and discernment, your spirit, the Holy Spirit that's in you, I should say, will let you know when it's a false teacher or a false preacher. You will get this feeling that something ain't right, something doesn't sound right, something isn't resonating, something is wrong with what this person is saying. 
But to get that wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and discernment, it's going to require that intimate time with God that I talked about on Sunday. Now, Solomon was blessed. God appeared to him in a dream and said, what do you want? What do you want from me? What is it you need? What, what do you want? And Solomon said, I'm a young man. I, I don't know. I'm supposed to be king and I'm supposed to be king over your people and I want to do a good job. But I don't know how, so can you help me? I, I need to understand. I need to hear with your heart. And so God blessed him with that. But he had spent time as a young man learning about God. He was a Jew, so he had to know those 613 laws. He had to know the Ten Commandments. They were drummed into him from the time he could talk until and even after he got this call from God that you're going to be the king. So it's different for us. That hasn't necessarily been drummed into us, that relationship with God. So we have to put the time in. So when was the last time you picked up your Bible and actually did some reading? And there's those who say, well, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't understand it. I get confused. I read devotionals, they, they help me. And, and yes, they do. The devotionals do help you because they'll give you a scripture in nugget form and they'll many times expound on it and explain it and make it clear. So I'm not against devotionals, understand that. But when was the last time that you truly sat with some scripture with God? When you weren't intimidated, and you were able to read it and understand it and hear what he was speaking to your heart. The Bible can be very intimidating. You, you hear me when I teach and when I preach, you very seldom will hear me use the King James Bible because I know <clears throat> how intimidating that can be to people. First of all, it's hard to read and understand. Second of all, it's hard to hear because you get distracted because the language in that Bible is not what you're used to hearing. The these and the thous can be confusing and distracting, but that doesn't give us a reason not to read. There are so many other translations and many times I use the message Bible and many times like tonight, I, I started off with, um, the battlefield, battlefield of the Mind Bible that is an amplified Bible that Joyce Meyer um, put together. We have to get the understanding we need from the Word of God. And the perfect one to make sure that we get the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding, and the discernment of what this book is saying is God praying to him and saying, I'm, okay, I'm getting ready to sit down and read. So I need wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and discernment because when I read this, I get absolutely confused. I don't know what it's saying. It's confusing. There's things that sound contradictory in some areas. So I need you to help me understand. He is standing there waiting for you to ask for that. As soon as you say it, Holy Spirit, you heard her. You got it? Okay. They're going to make sure that we get the understanding that we need. And <clears throat> he will also place people in your lives to help you get the understanding that you need. Because the thing about it is, as, as we grow individually in this relationship with God, then people will see the light of God in us. And they're going to ask us, what must I do to be saved? Or what, what is it that's different about you? And you get the opportunity to share with other people this change in your life that was brought on by your relationship with God, by having Jesus as your Savior and the Holy Spirit dwelling in you at all times. 
And trust me, they will fill your mouth with the words you need to share with that person on how this change occurred to you. But you won't know their voice. And I go back to what I said Sunday. You were blessed a couple of weeks ago for actually two weeks when Reverend Waverly spoke to you about hearing God's voice. If you haven't heard those messages, go back to find them and listen to them. Because the relationship we have with God that is so different than any other relationship is, well, it's a relationship. He wants us to talk to him, but he wants to talk to us. But how will you have the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding and the discernment to know it's his voice if you don't know what his word says? You need to take the time to begin to read his word faithfully to get the understanding of what he's trying to say to us. And if you don't know which translation of the Bible is gonna be best for you, go to a Christian bookstore or go to um, biblegateway.com and you can look at a variety of translations to see which one flows more smoothly for you, which one is easier to understand. I suggest that, but I don't suggest that, that, that you latch onto your phone as the only way to read your Bible. Because that phone is not your sword. That, sword. that phone is not your Bible. That phone is a resource to help you get to the word when you need it in an emergency or in a quick moment where you don't have a lot of time to get to where your Bible is. Your Bible was created for the relationship with God. Your phone was created for your relationship with the world. When you look at the stuff that is on your phone, okay, it could be anything from you just take phone calls on your phone to all the pornography in the world, all the dirty jokes in the world, all the cussing in the world. That's not in your Bible. Your Bible is the sword for spiritual warfare. As part of the attack of the enemy, we need to know the word of God. And if you think about it, when Jesus was being tempted by the enemy, three temptations, and each time Jesus began his answer with, it is written. And he was able to speak out the word of God. And the enemy knew the word of God. So he knew that what was coming at him was the word of God. And he, after the third time, he's like, okay, I'm done. I can try three different ways to get you to mess up. It didn't work. I figured it wouldn't, but I was going to try it anyway. I'm out. I'm gone. And he left. When the enemy comes at you, do you know what to say? When you're worst temptation comes at you, do you know what to say? Do you know what to do? Do you know what God's word says that can be that hedge of protection around you? This subject of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and discernment, we can only grow in those areas by developing that more intimate relationship with God, knowing what his word is saying to us. Now, this prayer, this, this book of Colossians that <clears throat> um, Paul is writing, he's writing to be part of that hedge of protection around them because he knows what's coming down the pike. He knows as he continues communicating with them that the enemy is at their doorstep and has moved into their house and is trying to distract them from God. So he needs to be clear and very clear in letting them know that we got you. We're covering you in prayer. 
this is a process, it is a maturing. So when he says to them, and I want to start with the start with the fifth verse. I hate it starting in the middle of a sentence, but it's kind of what I got to do because Paul writes very long sentences. He says, because of the confident hope of experiencing that which is reserved and waiting for you in heaven, you previously heard of this hope in the message of truth, the gospel regarding salvation, which has come to you. Indeed, just as in the whole world, the gospel is constantly bearing fruit and spreading by God's power, just as it has, just as it has been doing among you ever since the day you first heard of it and understood the grace of God and truth, becoming thoroughly and deeply acquainted with it. He's telling them that the word is not just being spread here with you, it's being spread worldwide. And it's, again, that, that seed analogy that where it is planted and received correctly, it will grow and it will grow and it will grow. Where it is dropped and not received, it's not gonna grow. So as this group of people is trying to do the right thing, other types of seeds are being sown in. So it's imperative that they're covered in prayer. So let me ask you a question. When you see on a Sunday morning, a person goes up and accepts Christ as their savior, do you put them on your prayer list? Do you take the time to encourage them in their walk? Do you think about what the attacks are or the distractions that are gonna come at them because they've made this decision? I mean, if you've walked any time in your relationship with God, you've seen that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So as a person gives their life to the Lord there, in that time of when we first get saved, we're so excited. We want to tell the whole world that we're saved. And they've gone down to the front and they've surrendered to God. Do you put them on your prayer list? Do you begin to cover them in prayer? If you haven't, don't feel guilty. Just start praying for them. They are the result of the seeds that have been planted by your pastoral team as well as at church. The word has been planted. They are the seed that has sprouted and it becomes our responsibility in part to begin to cover that person in prayer because they're coming in as that babe in Christ on the milk that I talked about earlier. They don't know what the word of God says. And they're gonna get sliced and diced because that's how this process goes. It's the things that slice and dice us, things that hurt and break us, that take us to God and make us reach for him. But if they're not covered in prayer, they could get discouraged and go back to wherever it was they came from that is not walking with God. The next verse says, you learned, you learned it from our representative Epaphras, our beloved fellow bond servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf. And he also has told us of your love, well-grounded and nurtured in the Holy Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about it, we have not stopped praying for you, asking specifically that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom with insight into his purposes and in understanding of spiritual things so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord displaying, displaying admirable character, moral courage and personal integrity to fully please him in all things, again, bearing fruit in every good work and steadily growing in the knowledge of God with deeper faith, clearer insight and fervent love for his precepts. And I'm gonna stop there, but Again, this is the analogy that is constantly used in the Bible is agricultural. 
seeds being sown. The learning, the growing. When you look at a seed is planted, it begins to sprout. And as it sprouts, it, it grows and it produces whatever fruit it's supposed to produce. They are wanting, he is wanting the Colossians to know that we're covering you, we're praying for you. But we're asking that you would be matured in this relationship. That's the only purpose for wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and discernment is for us to grow and mature and make good decisions that honor God. That we're able to minister to other people or exhort or encourage other people. You can't do it if you don't know who God is. You can do the, I like to use uh, Sinclair from Living Single, they're there, woo, woo, woo. That's encouragement that we give in social settings. But as you mature in your walk with God, there's a different type of encouragement that you begin to give when you really mean it, when you say to a person, I'm praying for you. Think about how you feel. Your back is up against the wall. You're getting beat down. And somebody has actually noticed it and said to you, I'm praying for you. As we grow in our walk with God, as we get closer, as we walk with wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and discernment, we begin to hear from the Holy Spirit how best to cover that person, how best to pray for that person, how best to encourage that person. But again, if you don't know the voice of God, then you have this feeling, but you won't know what it is. Or you'll look at them and say, oh man, that's really bad what they're going through. I feel really bad for them. Prayer won't even enter your mind. Maybe down the road it might, but initially you, you, and they needed your prayer in that moment. They needed your encouragement in that moment, but you couldn't hear the voice of God. And you didn't have an understanding of the situation. And because you didn't have the understanding, you didn't have the wisdom to know they need prayer. You didn't have the discernment to know if the situation was good or bad for them. This walk, again, is not just about you individually. You have been placed in circumstances by God to grow and to bless those people that are around you, whether it be that stranger that you run into that all you did was smile at them or your biggest enemy and you realize that God wanted you to pray for them or bless them, that is deep. That is a deep thing because he does that from time to time. He will take that person that has given you the most grief and say, pray for them. Do the what, how, what? Pray for them? After they did blah, blah, blah. Okay, now you gotta forgive them and pray for them, but pray for them nonetheless, get moving. If you can't hear his voice, you won't know how to act. You won't know what to do. And again, you need the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding and the discernment. So you can carry out the work that he wants you to do that gives him glory. Because what happens is when you move in obedience to God, even when it's in the beginning, when it's painful and something you don't want to do, as you do it, you, you might have an attitude in that first minute, but as it goes on, you have to stop and be like, wow, Lord. You, you let me do blah, blah, blah. You, you had me bless them. And it takes your relationship with him up a notch as well. And for those who are watching, when you've not bragged about it, for those who are watching and they see you bless that person or not strike back at that person, then again, they want to know, what is it that you know that I don't know that I need to know that now I know I need to know because you got it going on. 
So it gives you an opportunity to, to testify. But you need that wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and discernment so that relationship with God can grow and you can mature. And you can understand what is it that I'm going through? Because nothing we go through is wasted. Everything we go through, there's some kind of lesson in it. There's something that he wants to do with us. So we look at that 11th verse, we, we pray you may be strengthened and invigorated with all power according to his glorious might to attain every kind of endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints of God's people in the light. We are saved. We are his people, we are believers. But again, he doesn't want us saved and sitting. He doesn't want us just saved and not doing anything. I'm saved, I don't need anything else. No, he wants us to know him intimately. He wants us in a for real relationship with him. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 tells us to pray without ceasing. And there's a beautiful, Beautiful thought in that for me. Pray without ceasing says to me, he wants to hear from you whenever you want to talk. Whenever you find time to talk, he's ready, willing, and available. You know how you have friends that don't take calls before 10 o'clock and those who know me, shut up. I am the person that says, don't call me before 10 o'clock, okay? Well, God's not like that. He'll talk to you whenever you want. If you want to talk to him at two o'clock in the morning, he's there, ready, willing, able to listen. If you want to talk to him at 10 o'clock at night, he's there. Five o'clock in the afternoon, he's there. 10 minutes to six, he's there. Whenever you want to talk, he's available. But again, if you're not, if you only know you talk and you don't know his voice, First of all, it's a one-sided selfish relationship. But two, you need to know his voice. You, you need to be able to hear from him. You need to know what it is he wants you to do. And that comes from spending time building that intimate relationship with him. And think about it again. These people back in biblical days, they had a knowledge of who God was. They knew what the rules were, okay? And before Jesus, that's all they were supposed to know was what the rules were. They, they knew they needed to pray and they did. There were times that they prayed. They prayed. They talked to God. We don't necessarily roll like that. Many times we only pray because there's an issue we need help with. But they were moving relationally with him, not to the depths of what we have the ability of now. But they knew that he existed and they knew there was responsibility in that relationship. They knew there was rules and things they needed to follow. We are spoiled, lazy. We just skip down the street and we don't talk to them usually unless we need something. Yet he stands, the scripture says, at the door and knocks. Because not only does he want us saved, he wants us in relationship with him. So we go back to what you hear me say all the time. We have three purposes. Each and all of us have three purposes. Number one, to praise and worship God. Well, you can't praise and worship somebody that you don't know anything about. Now, you can stand and sing those songs, and they mean one thing when you're just standing and singing them. But when you've had that experience and you understand what do not pass me by means or talking to Jesus, you know what that song means because you had to talk to him. Totally different take, totally different take. Because at that point, 
you have knowledge, you have wisdom, you have understanding, you have discernment as to why you need to talk to him. But we learn those things two ways. One, because we're in his word reading or two, because things begin to happen that drive us to him and his word. So again, that first one is praising and worshiping him. As you begin to know him and know the things about him, you get excited and you wanna bless him and praise him for who he is and how he puts up with you and your rudeness, you and your rebelliousness, me and my rudeness, me and my rebelliousness, yes, us. The second thing is again, building that intimate relationship through praise and worship prayer, reading the Bible, studying the Bible, meditating on his word, fasting and giving. These are the things that draw us closer in relationship to him. And we do these things because we love him. Because we love the fact that as horrific as we can be, he still loves us and he takes us just as we are. He doesn't tell us that you got to clean up before I work with you. He doesn't tell us that you got to be perfect before I answer your prayer. The enemy would have you believe that you're never good enough. But God wants us to know that no matter what state you're in, it's your drunkest drunk, it's your highest high at your worst in whatever situation, he stands there ready, willing, and able to call you his own. You just got to surrender to him and keep surrendering and keep trying to get closer and closer to him. I, I go back to that scripture from Hebrews. You did the milk phase. We got to move to the solid food phase. The solid food phase is to begin getting to know him for yourself. So many times people base their relationship with God on what happens to them at Sunday at church. Well, I heard this sermon and last week I heard that sermon and, and that's it, that's their investment. And if you think about it, any relationship of any value with anybody, you know, you've got to put time in. You've got to know that person's likes, dislikes. Same thing with God. He just wants us to spend that time with him, getting to know him. When Paul says, we pray that you may be strengthened and invigorated with all power, according to his glorious might to attain every type of endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. For he has rescued us and drawn us to himself from the dominion of darkness. And he transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption because of his sacrifice resulting in the forgiveness of our sins and the cancellation of sins penalty. If we're not in real relationship with him, we really can't even comprehend what that forgiveness and saving cancellation from the penalty of sin is. It is in developing that closer walk with him that we really can understand and appreciate what he saved us from. We get cliche as you know, I was talking to somebody about this yesterday and I said, y'all hear me say it every Holy Week, every Holy Week, y'all hear me say it and you're like, here it comes. We do, we get so cliche-ish about, well, Jesus hung on the cross for my sins. But we don't really comprehend how horrific that voluntary act was that he did because he didn't have to do it but he and God and the Holy Spirit decided that we were worth it each of us are worth it he would have done it for one of us as well as all of us for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever 
You are that whosoever I am, that whosoever believe would have salvation. He loves us so much. And God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit pour and pour and pour out on us. And we sit back and we receive and we receive and we receive, but there comes the point when we have to show them that we love them and that we wanna to get to know them and we wanna understand them. So where are you at in your walk with God? Are you spending time getting to know him? Or are you just sitting back receiving? Calling on him in case of an emergency. Calling on him because you're sick or somebody you love is sick. Calling on him because you lost your job or your money's tight. And I don't condemn those actions, but those should be the only way you reach for him. You should be wanting to know this God who blessed us with so much, who felt we were so worthy that it was important enough that he would send his only son, his only begotten son down here to show us how to walk as Christians and then hang on the cross for our sins. And hanging on the cross was bad enough, but because Jesus was bearing all our sins, God had turned his back on Jesus and they were separated. That's how important we are to him that they chose to be separated from each other so that we could be joined back with God. So when we think about Jesus hung on the cross for our sins, do we understand the depths of it? Do we feel it in our heart, what he did for us? The enemy would have us hear the sugar-coated version. Oh, Jesus hung on the cross for our sins. Okay, let's move on to the next story in Bible study. But this, this need for us to develop the, the knowledge, the wisdom, the understanding, and the discernment is so important for us to appreciate the relationship with God, for us to appreciate the blessings that we get that we don't deserve. This grace and mercy that he continues to show us is because of his love because we could never do anything to earn it. We are, as the word says, but filthy rags. Even on our best day, we're not good enough. But he said that we were worth Jesus to him. He said that you're so important to me. I don't want to destroy the earth again. I, I can, but you're so important to me. I'm gonna send my son down there. And the son came down here. And at the last moment, he could have said, you know what? I'm looking at this group here and they're just stupid. And the ones coming, they're stupid. And you, you want me to hang on this cross for them so they can continue to do the same stupid stuff. They continue to be mean and ugly and angry. Where's them legions of angels? Let's just wipe them all out and start all over again but he didn't do that. Instead, he hung on that cross, took the separation from his father, went down to the grave, was resurrected, ministered to those disciples for 40 more days, went and is sitting on the right hand of his father. And then they began to feel those disciples with their words. And when you look at this book of Colossians, if you were blessed enough to hear Reverend Waverly this morning at 11 o'clock, she has a new program on uh, the word of God is therapeutic on Tuesdays at 11 o'clock. And she spoke today was the first program. And as she was teaching, she said, I'm starting in Colossians. And I went, oh, we get ready to do a same message. No, we, we're not. But 
the word of God is therapeutic, as she says in, in her message, but she reminded us of the sins that God is aware of, as well as the remedies. There is such a richness in this Bible that can strengthen us. And Jesus is speaking through, for Jesus is the living word. He's speaking through this word and we pray you may be strengthened and invigorated with all power according to his glorious might to attain every kind of endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. Just that piece right there, that reminder that we need the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding, and the discernment so that we can endure, so that we can move forward in this walk with God, so that we can strengthen our relationship with him, so that we can hear clearly from him and know his voice, so that we can fulfill the purposes that he put us on this earth for, because there is something we need to do. Now, there are some things that he allows us to do that we kind of just fall into and don't even realize that that was part of your purpose. But there's other times, for the most part, that we need to get in there and get to know this God that has not wiped us out yet, that still loves us, that still forgives us. We need the time. And the only way that we can grow is again by spending intimate time with him. At the end of every post that I send Pastor Chris for him to advertise the next message, it always says this message is part of a series on spiritual warfare because every message it's about strengthening your relationship with God, giving you tools to use so that when the enemy comes, you know what it is you need to do. All of the messages point to Christ, point to relationship with God. This wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and discernment is message for the sword of the spirit in getting your wisdom knowledge understanding and discernment you will understand the word of god and when the enemy comes at you you'll be able to know what to speak at him it is written and whatever the holy spirit gives you to say or whatever scripture the holy spirit brings to you and it doesn't even have to be like that. It's a scenario where something happens. You don't know what to do. And you pray and you ask God, give me wisdom. Help me to know what to do in this situation. Because sometimes he'll tell you, move. Other times, it's you figuring out what to do based on what he's telling you to do. But if you don't recognize his voice, you won't know what it is you're supposed to do. And if you can't remember his word, you won't know what it is you're supposed to do. And if you don't know his word, you're not gonna know what to do. The times that we're living in, we have a whole lot of people talking a whole lot of stuff that is not what God said. And you will believe it because of the passion, the artistry, the performance that they put on. And a lot of them gonna have to stand before the Lord and explain why they told that lie. Why they manipulated God's people, why they gave bad information to the sheep that he placed under them. 
The word tells us that as teachers, we are held to a higher standard. So we need to be giving you what the Lord says. Same thing for pastors, preachers, evangelists, all of us have a responsibility to share the true word of God with you and not to sugarcoat it. And as part of that, we need to tell you truthfully, get you a Bible and start reading. If you don't know what Bible you need, I tell people the Life Application Study Bible is one of the best Bibles there is because it has notes to give you clarity and understanding. The Message Bible is a good Bible. The only thing is it doesn't have study notes and I need study notes, okay? The Common English Bible is a good Bible to read. But the thing is the the um, New King James Bible is gonna be the one that's closest to the King James Bible. And if you get the Life Application Study Bibles, again, it will have the notes in it that will help you. We don't have time to be lackadaisical. Things are happening crazy. You have things going on in, in Russia and the Ukraine and Taiwan and China, and we don't know who's going to do what next. Your relationship with God needs to be strong. You need that wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and discernment just to make it through another day. So you rob yourself of blessings by not going deeper in your relationship with God. We have responsibility for our relationship with God. If you have children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews, you have a responsibility to cover and pray for them and to help them learn about God. If you have siblings and parents, you need to help make sure they understand as well. Wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and discernment. If we have those things, it makes our walk a little bit easier because sometimes we get involved in stuff we don't have no business being involved in. And if we had just but prayed and asked for wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and discernment, we might not have stepped into the path of the oncoming bus, okay? And I don't mean a physical bus, I mean the situation that is draining you, that you had no business being in because instead of doing the God thing, you did the good thing, spoken from experience. Wisdom, knowledge, understanding and discernment, ask God for those things and pray it for those that you love. Think about this, this prayer that Paul did again in First Colossians, we pray for you. Do that same thing for others. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we bless you and we praise you. We thank you for the mercy that you show us that we don't even deserve. We ask, Lord, that you would change our hearts, remove our stubbornness, remove our self-centeredness, remove all those things that would distract us from you. Give us a hunger and a thirst for your word that we would read, that we would be able to hear your voice. That when we ask for wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and discernment, and you give us an answer, we'll hear it, we'll understand it. We thank you so much, Lord, for your patience and your forgiveness that you show us. And we thank you for the grace and the mercy that you show us that we don't deserve. And we thank you for loving us. Father, we ask, Lord, that you be with us, that you lead, guide, and direct our path, and that, again, we hear clearly from you and move in obedience to you. Father, we ask these things, Lord, in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, we say amen and amen. All right, family, have a blessed day, and I will talk to you the next time, Sunday. Bye-bye.